take a moment so that we can all get settled down and we'll get started because I know everybody here is really excited to hear, oh thank you, I'm doing the lights a little bit, really excited to have us get started and have this celebration here as a prelude to the march tomorrow. what I came for, right? <laughs> so, I'm Michelle DePass. I'm the Dean of the Milano School of International Affairs, Management and Urban Policy here at the New School. And we welcome you! So, this is not about speeches, this is not about presentations, this is about getting us ready and psyched. <laughs> 20 years ago, when I started my environment and energy, career, shall we say, I mean, there was always this need for a big, bold, audacious call to action. And you know what? Tomorrow is it. <laughs> Our dreams are going to come true because we are going to turn the paradigm upside down tomorrow. Yeah. We are going to be loud, we are going to be proud, we are going to amplify, we are going to justify. Tomorrow is the day that we are waiting for and the day after is the day when we're in charge. And if you don't believe it, then it's not going to happen. So every one of us has to believe it and embrace it. So. I do have a little bit of housekeeping to do before we get to our incredible speakers. We have an amazing program sponsor, and that program sponsor is Grist Magazine. So I'm going to open up, before I tell you about some of the other sponsors, I'm just going to open up with a really short clip around Grist just to sort of put you in the space and place. And I've been tasked to do some technology here, and let's hope it works. I'm just gonna press a button. We all know the saying, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade, right? But what about when life gives you lemons, oil spills, toxic products, filthy politicians, and the looming climate apocalypse? At Grist, we serve green news with a load of smarts and a splash of sass. You'll be stirred, not shaken. We know this stuff is serious. After all, we are standing at the edge of the void, the brink of total annihilation, powerless as the planet cooks, and we all meet our fiery ends. <sighs> but we also know that lively voices, inspiring stories, and funny headlines are what get people to look, listen, and help turn this planetary ship around. The occasional fuzzy wuzzy baby animal video helps too. So <laughs> oh cute. My God, <laughs> We've had a lot of laughs. But we've also inspired tons of people to get off their butts and take action. From shopping differently to starting urban gardens, to pushing for better transportation options, to demanding change from the suits in charge. We've made real progress happen, from the halls of Congress to the hills of Hollywood. But there's so much more to do. And one thing missing. You. Yeah, that's right, you. Want to impress people with your astonishing knowledge of current events? Want to save money at home and make your community stronger? And help the planet avoid total catastrophe? Grist is the place. Welcome. No Birkenstocks required. Grist. Read it, share it, love it, support it. Phew, that worked. Okay. So, Grist is one of the sponsors of what we're calling here Climate Week. And Bill and I are proud board members of Grist. So, with 300 distinct readers are environmental news. 300 million, excuse me. 3 million, hello, 3 million. This is why I became a lawyer and not a doctor. 3 million distinct readers every month. We invite all of you in the room to join our revolution online with Grist. So this Climate Action Week began as a request for endorsement and has grown to a robust expression of our university's commitment to climate change issues and to being part of the solution. In May, Bill McKibben issued a striking call to arms in Rolling Stones magazine 
inviting all the world to come to New York City ahead of the UN climate talks, September 23rd. The new school, we heeded that call to action. Today, as we prepare to participate in the historic People's Climate March tomorrow, the new school is here to recommit ourselves, not just to the march, but to carry forth the spirit of the collective to long-term, sustained, just responses to the climate crisis. Through our interdisciplinary research that helps shape and inform decision-making and scholarship, our students' passionate involvement, our collaborations with communities and organizations on the front lines, the new school stands ready to continue to be a force for change and solidarity for climate justice. We came to We came together, a small band of us, uh, colleagues from the Environmental Policy and Sustainability Management Program at Milano, colleagues from the New School for Public Engagement here at the New School, colleagues from the Sustainability Club, colleagues from Tishman Center for Environment and Design and GRIST, and worked with 350.org, the Climate Justice Alliance, and many partners that are here that are making up this march to be able to put on what we call Climate Week. And we're just in the middle of it. So come along for the ride. So my job and uh, distinct pleasure first is to introduce Chip Giller. So you saw a clip, really exciting, really funny. It's, uh, you know, it's news with a sense of humor because you know what? Sometimes you gotta laugh about the energy and environment news or you might cry. So as a sponsor, GRIST has been covering all sorts of activities around Climate Week and uh, leading up to the Climate March. Their coverage of climate issues and the environment generally, as I said, is done with a blend of humor and insight that inspires broad action and awareness of issues. And it can sometimes feel, we know, overwhelming and complex, but GRIST breaks it down for us. Chip founded GRIST in 1999 to lighten up the movement, known for taking itself very seriously. Chip thought about these issues when he was in college. And for all of my, my colleagues out there and students, I want you to really think about the fact that you don't have to wait to make change. You can start it right now, from today. He's been honored with the Heinz Award for his media innovations and for making environmental issues relevant to new and broad audiences. And he's been named a Time Magazine Hero of the Environment. Chip has been featured in such outlets as Vanity Fair, Newsweek, Outside, and has appeared on broadcast programs, including the Today Show and PBS's Now. Before launching Grist, Chip was editor of GreenWire, the first environmental news daily. He's a native of Massachusetts, graduated from Brown. You should have graduated from here, but that's okay. <laughs> he has an honors degree in environmental studies, and he is an obsessive Red Sox fan, and that's an issue between us, because uh, I am a New Yorker. When Chip's not pondering the future of online environmental journalism, he likes to spend his time with his wonderful wife, Jenny, and his adorable kids, Ellis and Sebastian, at their home in Vashon Island in Seattle. So he came a little way. But many of you out there came a little way too. When I was walking down the street, I met a fantastic couple who was here from Texas and had brought their, um, their banner that they asked me to sign and asked Bill to sign. And people have been signing it ever since the cop when they were there and they've been carrying it around. So um, I salute you guys. I also salute why I am doing this and why I'm committed to climate change. My son, Alexander, he's two, he's running around somewhere out there, I'm sure, with my husband, Joshua. But it is about the next generation. And I have done a lot of work with indigenous communities and they've taught me uh, and helped me understand about the seven generations that come behind us and how we have got to, we have got to leave the earth in a better space for them. So without further ado, I welcome Chip Giller up to the stage.
Thanks, Michelle, and thank you guys all for turning out. Um, uh, I'm not really going to talk about GRIS very much. I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about why I'm here this week and why I'm going to be marching tomorrow. And um, just to start, though, I need to tell a little bit of a, a story about my youth, which was kind of peculiar and a little weird. You see, I grew up with these two twin obsessions, one around journalism and the other around the environment. And um, uh, one of my first babysitters, actually, was the man you're all here to hear speak, Bill McKibben. Uh, so I think it was roughly at age three or four, I began to grow concerned about climate change. Um, um, and, uh, you know, I went on to uh, edit the same high school newspaper Bill did, and I would write these kind of very earnest articles about you know, people shouldn't litter, and they should be concerned about their energy usage. Then I went to Brown, as Michelle said, and I would do these things on campus, like I would mount personal protests, where I carried in, my, in, a, in a clear plastic bag for an entire week all the trash I'd produced that week. And I'd kind of trudge around campus, and I'd expect like everyone to rebel and rise up against the consumer system. And instead, it was a rather lonely one-person protest, and it wasn't really that great for the dating scene. Uh, so, you know, I just began to observe through my, through my personal experience that we needed a broader tent and more people on board, and maybe we needed, I, we needed to think about new ways to communicate about environmental issues. So um, I started GRIS now a long time ago, 15 years ago, really to, to, to re-envision what the movement could be, to reimagine what environment, uh, the people who were attached to and, and fighting for environmental progress who they were. And as Michelle said, we've had some degree of success for reaching uh, a couple million different folks a month. Um, but it's really, uh, in large part, um, thanks to, to Bill McKibben's work, I think that, that uh, we've, seen, we've shown so much progress. And just a, a couple words about Bill. I mean, Bill was really born with the brains and the brawn and the, the habits of a journalist and a thinker. Um, and, and through his work, I mean, when he was a young man, he wrote The End of Nature, which is really the first book uh, about climate change for a broad audience. It filled an entire issue of The New Yorker. And he's gone on to produce uh, many, many other books and to deepen thinking on these issues. But what Bill's done over the last uh, seven or eight years is really transform himself uh, from a, a, a journalist and someone who's sort of observing on the sidelines into an organizer. Because he's really recognized that what we need are more, more bodies out there, more people out there. Um, so I just wanted to um, thank him for the inspiration he's provided to me, the, the inspiration he's provided to the, to the whole movement. And um, I'm just excited to be here, and I'm excited to be marching with you all tomorrow. Um, there's so much more work to be done, but I feel like we, we know what the solutions are. Casey Golden here is from uh, Climate Solutions. I mean, the solutions are clear. We can have a clean energy revolution. We just need, we just need to be fighting for it. We need to be showing up. And so um, that's what tomorrow is about. I think tomorrow is about hope and fellowship. And um, I'm just excited not to be uh, just protesting as a group of one tomorrow, but marching with everyone, <laughs> tens of thousands of people. So, um, Bill, why don't you come on up? Thanks to Michelle and to Chip for bringing us grist every day, the kind of um, daily digest of the actual real world. I always, you know, I was thinking last week when I looked at every newspaper I looked at, every website, they were live blogging the launch of the iPhone 6, you know, just round the, I mean, it was something that everybody knew what it was. All it was was an advertisement anyway. And, 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 I thought, huh, I wonder if anyone will bother to do this when we have, you know, the biggest political gathering in a generation on the streets of New York tomorrow. Um, probably not in quite the same way, but there's actually going to be a lot of journalists there, and the reason is because there are going to be a lot of people there. Um, this thing is shaping up somewhat bigger than we'd expected. There are at least 500 buses on the way. 
Uh, I've talked to people today who arrived on the climate train from San Francisco. We just met our Texan marchers who arrived. Um, it's beautiful. It's just the, the, we, we've been hoping we were going to have 100,000 people if all went well, and it's clear we're going to have twice that and maybe more. Um, It's going to be a remarkable day, and the new school will be a big part of it. Um, you guys have um, been very gracious hosts as, uh, 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 for all of us who are arriving here and letting us use this place, and your students doing a remarkable job of, of gathering the spirit um, that's required. It's our pleasure. <laughs> now, um, I gotta say, uh, I had next to nothing to do with organizing this march, which is a good thing. Um, um, it's a good thing in part because it would be even more chaotic than it's going to be if I was actually organizing it. And it's a good thing because there's now lots of people doing this kind of stuff. I was thinking today about the day six, two, fourteen, two thousand eight, uh, eight years ago, uh, this month. When we organized the first, now this one actually did help organize really, uh, first march across Vermont um, for five days, where, uh, Vermont's where I live, uh, for five days, uh, you know, we slept in farm fields and stuff at night. And, and, and when we got to Burlington, um, there were a thousand people marching, which actually in Vermont's actually a lot of people. And, and, <laughs> And it turned out, it said in the newspaper the next day, that this was the largest march about climate change that had yet taken place in the United States. And when I read that, I thought, no wonder we get our butt kicked all the time. No wonder the fossil fuel industry always wins. We have, we have all the things that you would need for a movement, the sort of superstructure. We've got you know, the scientists and the engineers and the policy people and Al Gore and on and on and on. The only part of the movement that we forgot was the movement part. Um, um, there's just no people there. So that's when we started organizing 350.org. And for you students, I mean, um, you know, it began in 2008, six years ago, with um, myself and, and seven undergraduates at, at uh, college in Vermont. Um, so just the same as y'all. and. Um, and because there are so many people, not because we're great organizers, because there's so many people around the world who want to be doing something about this, um, um, things have grown rapidly as they need to. There'll be 200 times as many people as there were in that march across Vermont out on Sunday, and we're gonna need more yet after that. Movements have to move and grow. That's how they work. Um, The, um, the point is, well, one point is, we really shouldn't in some way have to go march, I guess. I mean, in a reasonable civilization, um, when the scientists of the world unanimously said the worst thing that ever happened is happening, you, our political leaders would have said, okay, perhaps our job description includes doing something about that. Um, but they didn't say that. And, and it slowly dawned on some of us that it was time, um, that, that, that reason was not going to carry the day, that it was going to take more than reason, that uh, uh, having won the argument, we were also going to have to win the fight. And since we couldn't match the money of the fossil fuel industry, we were going to have to find another currency to work in. And the only one we could think of were the currencies of movements, um, passion and spirit and creativity and numbers. So it really matters that there are gonna be a lot of people out there. That's our weight on the scale on the other side from the money and all the other side. Money usually wins left to its own devices, it always wins, but history indicates that when people are willing to really go all out in large numbers, then they have some chance of matching that money and that's what we gotta do. been doing this a very long time, much longer than me. They wised up much earlier, and it's been a great pleasure to sort of be working with them all the way through. Uh, when we're done here, there's going to be a remarkable panel from um, indigenous women in this 
continent. Uh, it's been one of the great privileges of the last few years for me to get to work more and more and more with indigenous communities um, um, who really, I mean, for instance, we've been fighting on this Keystone thing now for three years, about three years ago, almost to the week that, you know, some of us were uh, in jail for a while and things. Um, when we kind of launched the national version of this fight, but that fight had been going on for years before and had been led by um, Native North Americans on both sides of the border who were fighting for their land. And some of those people, Clayton Thomas Muller, I think, will be here in a little while, and, 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 and others who just were, you know, been remarkable leaders and were the people that, um, that I turn to when we wanted to get involved and, and what a pleasure and what a pleasure to see now this kind of broadening movement. One of the things we've tried to do at 350.org from the beginning is organize around the world. I'd always been told, you know, that environmentalism was something for rich white people to do. Um, um, and then if you didn't know where your next meal was coming from, you wouldn't be an environmentalist and on and on and on. When we did our first big day of action in 2009 around the world, we, somewhat to our surprise, managed to coordinate about 5,200 demonstrations in 181 countries on the same day. And as the pictures from those things poured in, it was clear to me within half an hour of watching, you know, 20 pictures a minute come in, that that old idea about who environmentalists were was just nonsense. Almost all the people we were working with are poor and black and brown and Asian and young because that's what almost all the people in the world are. Um, and, and oddly enough, they're as concerned about the future as anybody else, maybe more so. And, and, and because the future bears down very hard on you in a lot of places now. And that's why it's been so much fun to watch this march come together in really remarkable ways. Most of the leadership of the organizing has come from the environmental justice community here in New York. Um, um, friends and allies like Eddie Batista or Elizabeth Yampierre or, or you know Thomas Carduno or people who are uh, people who've been leading among other things the fight to recover from Sandy. You know the stock exchange was back up and running in two or three days but not so the Rockaways, not so a, 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 a lot of the rest of uh, uh, the metropolitan area. That's always the case. It's always, wherever you are, it's always the poorest people that are the hardest hit, and, and, and they are the ones who've been doing most of this organizing. And it'll be beautiful to see the march being led tomorrow by frontline communities and indigenous people, and it'll, um, uh, it'll get a kick since we're starting at Columbus Circle. It'll be kind of fun to watch everybody um, uh, you know, uh, uh, thumbing their nose just a little bit at Christopher Columbus as they go by. Uh, 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 just a little. What's really sweet right now, and the reason I was sitting over in the corner uh, tapping away, um, already from around the planet, uh, this march is underway. There are 2,900 solidarity marches taking place. <laughs> in 170 some countries, and I've been in my inept way, Chip was trying to help me uh, tweet out pictures of these things as they came in. Um, um, I have very limited mastery of the computer, that's why I work entirely with people younger than myself. And um, um, the pictures are amazing. And you know, some of them are coming from, from places you might expect, Stockholm and Oslo and you know, where all the climate protesters somehow look just as handsome and glamorous as all the other people there, and you know, it's good. But some of them are coming from just, the, I mean, the, the biggest so far seem to be coming from across India, huge demonstrations in Hyderabad and in the beautiful Nilgiri Hills, and uh, you know, and a really big one in Delhi. Uh, our 350 India team was just sending me picture after picture. And some of them are coming from just impossible places. The ones I was looking at just a moment ago were from Goma in the, the Congo, which is in that zone that's just been, you know, at the heart of this endless back and forth civil war where, you know, people dying all the time and, 
uh, just the thought that people there have the, the time and energy um, um, to stop for a while and organize a climate march um, um, is a good sign and a good reminder of us for us to um, work ever the much harder. And um, because, among other things, um, my guess is that people in Goma did very little to cause the problem that we are now facing. Okay. Um, um, that question of what we're going to do afterwards and how it's all going to work is an important question, of course, because um, uh, you know it'll be a great march tomorrow, and but it's one day in the life of a movement, and movements go on, and most of the days you're not having huge marches. Most of the days you're doing all kinds of other things, and that's what everyone will keep doing. We'll keep working to play defense against all the terrible ideas that are going on t around the world, and it's fun to see how well that defense is going. I see Casey Goldman out here from Seattle, uh, one of the leaders in the fight to stop those coal ports along the Pacific Coast. Uh, 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 there, were, uh, there were six of them proposed, yes, Casey, and we're Four three down. down. How many down? Four down. Four down. Four down. <laughs> And the other two are not going to get built. Um, no. um, you know, it's really good to see all the uh, uh, fractivists here um, um, from all around the uh, all around the country, but all around the state of New York. They're winning too. I don't know if anybody paid any, any New Yorkers paid any attention to the election returns yeah. last week, but Andrew Cuomo, governor of New York, uh, up against an unknown upstart opponent with two hundred thousand dollars to her name lost every county in the fracking district, so New York State. Uh, uh, politicians, politicians need to know, they need to know increasingly that they mess with us at their peril. Um, they're scared of all that fossil fuel money. We need them a little scared of us, too. And, and that's what uh, tomorrow is about. Uh, so many fights. Sometimes we're playing defense. Sometimes we're playing offense, which is what that divestment battle that's going on now all over the world is about, about trying to put these guys on their back heel. And it's been really exciting to watch uh, uh, how many places we're able to take on the fossil fuel industry. Some of them, you know, ones we'd expect. Uh, it didn't completely surprise me um, when, you know, Hampshire College or someplace divested, uh, though I was incredibly happy for their leadership. It won't surprise me that we'll, I bet we'll hear soon, soon that the new school has decided to divest. <laughs> But it was a tremendous sign earlier this summer when uh, the University of Dayton, uh, big, biggest, I think, university in that radical state of Ohio and a Roman Catholic, a Roman Catholic institution announced total fossil fuel divestment of their half billion dollar endowment. That was really good news. Um, Really good news from the World Council of Churches earlier this summer, representing 580 million Christians, announced that they were divesting. Um, um, this kind of thing is happening now around the planet. Australia is probably leading the world now in divestment. Their operation down there is fantastic. Those are the kind of things and more that we're going to need to be doing o o over the next little while. Now, I'm not, since I'm not really at all a great organizer. I'm a writer. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not like, I, I'm not good at, I shouldn't really be doing this sort of rally because this sort of like complete, you know, roused, whatever thing is just, I can't, I have to be completely honest. I mean, it's, you know, it's not guarantee we win this thing. Um, and in fact, we're definitely not going to win it entirely. I mean, it's already, planet's already warmed a good deal. And we've already seen a good deal of damage. I mean, it's, the most important thing that happened in the life of anyone in this room yeah. is that we left behind the Holocene and moved into something else. I mean, the summer Arctic is now mostly melted. The, the uh, West Antarctic ice sheet is in a state of irrevocable melt. Um, the ocean's already about 30% more acidic. We're not that going back on any of that. We've increased the temperature a degree, and even if we do everything right, we're gonna increase it two degrees Celsius, or almost four degrees Fahrenheit, and that'll be miserable. It's going to be a difficult century. The question is, will it be an impossible one? 
because what we're on a trajectory right now is to raise the temperature four or five degrees Celsius, eight nine eight nine degrees Fahrenheit. If we do that, we don't get to have a civilization anymore, and that's the stakes. I mean, stakes stakes have never been higher. I mean, uh, uh, it's it's probably useful that we think a little bit as we're out marching tomorrow just about what a privilege and what an obligation it is to get to be alive and aware at the moment when the biggest thing that ever happened was happening. Um, um, and and, and so, we, um, so we go on as best we can. Uh, 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 and I, with ever more optimism, because the, um, the remarkable spread of this movement and its remarkable diversity this is the first global movement for the first global crisis, and you guys right now are at its head. When we get to 1 o'clock, I think 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, first there's going to be a, um, a moment of silence for a couple of minutes, and we will remember all the people who have already died in this Crisis. I've, you know, I've had the privilege of being all over the world, but sometimes it's really hard. I remember being in Bangladesh when they're having the first big outbreak of dengue fever, a disease that's just spreading like wildfire. And there were lots of people. I spent a lot of time in the slum, so I eventually got bit by the wrong mosquito and got sick myself. And but you know, I was strong and healthy and well fed, so I didn't die. But lots of people did. And to watch that happen and to reflect on the fact that you can't even calculate how much carbon. Bangladesh puts into the atmosphere, it's just a rounding error, you know, in the, in the numbers. The unfairness of it all, I mean, we need to reflect on that in that moment of silence. And then, when it is over, we need to make some noise. For a minute, we're going to make as much, if you have a trumpet, bring your trumpet. If you have, perhaps you, you know, instead play the air horn, you know, bring it. Uh, uh, bring whatever you got that makes a lot of noise, even if it's only your vocal cords, because for a minute, we're going to sound the alarm, um, um, we're going to sound like the burglar alarm on the people who are stealing our future. Um, and it's going to be loud and pointed and sharp. And we hope that some of the people who need to hear it will hear it. They won't, this won't fix things this week at this climate summit in New York. They're not going to accomplish much. But it will start, start to put enough pressure in the system that the politicians will have to start figuring out some way to relieve that pressure. And the more pressure we put in, the more they're going to have to do. That's how activism works. There's nothing incredibly subtle or nuanced or anything about it, I think, at this point. It's we've got to put pressure on in this system so that someone has to release it. And that's, that's, what, um, that's why it's so good that you're all here. And that's why it's um, lucky for you that you're going to get to tell me everybody, um, as long as you're alive, that you got to be there at the moment when this movement really, really came of age, um, um, that um, you got to pay witness to the predicament that we were in, and you got the chance to do something about it. So I am so, so, so grateful that everybody's here, and so much looking forward being out on Central Park West with you tomorrow morning. Um, um, it's going to be mild chaos, so just <laughs> bear with it, stay calm, tell everybody around you just to bear with it and enjoy. There are 29 marching bands coming for your listening pleasure. Uh, uh, I've been out in the Art building headquarters, the warehouses across Bushwick and other parts of Brooklyn and Queens where there are hundreds of artists building floats, making banners, on and on and on. It's going to be big, beautiful, loud, um, and, 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 um, and it's going to matter. And y'all are going to matter in it. Um, thank you so, so much for being here. Uh,